Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with Florence Blum discussing his latest book, Integrations, The Struggle for Racial Equality and Civic Renewal in Public Education, in conversation with Winston C. Thompson. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Ethics in Your World series presented with the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, featuring leading thinkers taking on tough problems that matter to us all. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series and others. So do check out our website for our complete event calendar at harvard.com slash events. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speakers something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat section of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can pre-order your copy of Integrations. Please note that the book will be available upon its publication date, May 14th. If you already have reserved a copy of the book or would like to contribute to the series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. And lastly, as you may know from the large virtual gatherings we've all attended this together this past year, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. And now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Lawrence Blum is Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Liberal Arts and Education and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. For the past 40 years, he has worked extensively as a public philosopher and as an occasional public school instructor on the intersections of the philosophy of race, education, and moral philosophy. He is the author of I'm Not a Racist, but The Moral Quandary of Race and High Schools, Race, and America's Future, what students can teach us about morality, diversity, and community. Winston C. Thompson is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Studies and associate professor in the Department of Philosophy by courtesy at The Ohio State University. A former fellow in residence at the Safra Center, Thompson's scholarship analyzes the dilemmas of educational policy as they pertain to issues of justice, education, ethics, and the public good. Today, they'll be discussing Lawrence's latest work, Integrations, the Struggle for Racial Equality and Civic Renewal in Public Education. Focusing on multiple marginalized groups in American schooling, Integrations highlights segregation, so often erroneously and dangerously attributed to a bygone and overcome past as ongoing, pervasive, and multifaceted in its reach and application. Here, we encounter the voices of indigenous people Black, Latinx, and Asian Americans, communities of color who survive segregated public school environments despite resource and accessibility, injustice, and, Lawrence argues, a fundamentally flawed understanding of what integration has meant and continues to mean. As we continue to live out an American present shaped by multiple specific histories, integrations is an essential reminder that we must consider justice in the plural as well if we are to create a more equitable system for all. We are so happy to be hosting this discussion on our virtual platform this afternoon. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The, dig the digital podium is yours, Lawrence and Winston. Thanks so much, Benjamin. I mean, this is really just a treat. It's a delight to be here with you today, uh, all of you here in attendance. It's a delight. Larry, to be here with you and to, to talk with you uh, about your book. So uh, thank you for uh, 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 the opportunity and the experience uh, that's made possible uh, by your work. Uh, Larry, I know that you, know, uh, you and your co-author, uh, Zoe Burkholder, have been working on this book for a while now. In some sense, given the increased attention uh, to matters of racial and other forms of, of justice, um, it really seems that the book is arriving uh, at a quite, quite powerful moment. Uh, so I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to have a discussion that sort of taps into uh, some of what uh, people have been thinking about uh, these sort of larger questions about uh, race and justice 
particularly as they uh, intersect with some of the interests that you uh, and Zoe Burkholder have in this book. Thank you, thank you. Of course, uh, so yeah, please. Uh, I, I was just gonna say an introductory thing. I'm, I'm so pleased to be speaking at Harvard Bookstore where I have been shopping for 57 years and uh, sometimes feel that I kind of live there. Um, and I also was a fellow at the Saffir Center many, many, many years ago. So I'm also pleased to be having that, that sponsorship. And, and then again, also very pleased, Winston, that, you know, that you are, that I'm speaking with you. We, we've spoken often about these kinds of issues. Your thinking has informed my thinking in this book. <laughs> so, so it's, you know, your responsibility as well. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased about that. And thanks to everyone who is able to attend. I'm not accustomed to speaking where I can't see anyone. So I'll do my best, but I'm glad you're here. Well, it's terrific, Larry. I mean, it's a treat for, uh, for me as well. And I'm sure it's also a treat for uh, everyone in attendance. So let's then transition into, you know, uh, a discussion of the book uh, without much uh, uh, further ado. I mean, you know, perhaps a good place to start is, you know, in the same way that uh, the casual uh, reader might come across this book as they're walking through perhaps Harvard Bookstore or, or elsewhere, uh, and they come across the book, um, uh, they're likely to take a look uh, first at uh, the cover uh, and to see the title, right? So uh, it's the case that uh, uh, your book's title, Integrations, The Struggle for Racial Equality and Civic Renewal in Public education uh, might strike folks uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons that I think folks might find the title striking is that in the title, uh, you, you use the term integrations, right, uh, in plural. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the reason there? What point are you making uh, with that, uh, that plural uh, uh, terminology of integrations? How does that uh, help us um, uh, sort of think about integration in this context? Yes, the, the choice of integrations was, was very intentional. <clears throat> I think I want to make a preliminary remark about the book. Yeah. The book is a partnership between an historian and a philosopher, and it's part of a series of books at the University of Chicago that all have that character. And the idea is that education is a field that's often thought of primarily as a social science-based field. And to have two people from the humanities, from history and philosophy, the thought is that th this is a distinct angle of, of approach. So in terms of the, the pluralization, there are several different uh, purposes of, of the plural. One is to recognize that the word integration is used in different ways, in different historical periods and by different people, and that we have to recognize that plurality if we're going to be able to ask important questions about uh, integration, such as does integration promote educational equality, which is one of the core questions uh, in the book. So we delineate three basic uh, definitions of, of uh, integration. These are not the only possible ones, but they're important ones. The first one goes back to the Brown decision of 1954 that called for integration. And here integration meant what was also called or, uh, desegregation. And that was the dismantling of the legal structure of white supremacist Jim Crow segregation in the Southern US at the time in which that system governed every every institution and domain of life, including education. Integration according to the Brown decision meant that school districts could no longer run two distinct school systems as they customarily did, one for black students and one for white students. Integration in this sense also carried the implication though this was not made fully explicitly in the, in the Brown decision of rejecting the ideology of segregation that had underpinned the social system of, 
of segregation by declaring blacks to be inferior to whites and unsuited to share the same schools. Over time, a second meaning of integration arose, and this one I think is probably the most familiar one in the present. And it simply refers to students of different racial groups occupying the same schools and same classrooms. This, this definition is different from the uh, desegregation one because the Brown decision did not actually fully require black and white students who were the populations at the time that the case was about. It didn't actually require them to be in the same school. It just removed certain barriers that kept them apart. And the, the second meaning, which we call de descriptive integration in the, in the book, simply means that these students are now attending or it's referring to a situation in which students of different racial groups attend the same schools. Um, obviously, these two different meanings provide two different relationships between, say, inequality and uh, integration and, and uh, equality or inequality. In the desegregation case, integration um, as a form of equality, it's sort of built into the definition of mm. desegregation, that you're removing an inequality generating structure, namely uh, white supremacist uh, Jim, Jim Crow segregation, so that it has a, a sort of a closer relationship to the idea of equality. It, it turns out to be sort of limited for the more robust uh, kind of equality that one would want and that we spend that uh, spell out in, in the book. But um, <coughs> descriptive integration, by contrast, just says the students are in the same classrooms. It doesn't necessarily have any relationship to equality kind of built into it. It's just a purely mm -hmm. empirical question whether the co-presence of students from different racial groups will create um, equality. So, for example, um, it doesn't guarantee that students of different races inside the same group will be treated equally. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the Brown decision first came down, black uh, mm -hmm. teacher professional groups were concerned about black students starting to attend all white schools that they wouldn't be treated fairly. And that was a concern that they were trying to bring to the attention of their, of their white colleagues at the time. But there's a third meaning of integration that also has historical roots, but is in some way responsive to this, the descriptive form. And it, it sort of builds on the idea that merely having students in the same room together or in the same school building together somehow isn't real integration. That real integration should be something that has a more noble an ideal dimension to it. And we, we refer to this third meaning as ideal integration in the book. And Martin Luther King Jr. articulated a version of this group when he said that the mere physical proximity between racial groups involved in descriptive integration is not enough because it allows, as he calls it, spiritual segregation among those in physical uh, proximity. So ideal integration in our understanding involves a set of ideals which presuppose descriptive integration, but which go beyond it. And which mm -hmm. includes things like ideals of mutual respect, of treating the other students as equals, of valuing the racial others, heritage and, and experiences. So, so those ideals are sort of part of the idea of ideal integration. Obviously, ideal integration is more likely to promote equality than mere descriptive because it does have some equality uh, tending dimensions into the, in the ideals that are involved in it. So by using integration in the plural, we're calling attention to the fact that these that there are these different uh, definitions of uh, integration, they're out there and they're all legitimate and they all pick up on something important historically. So it's not like one of them is wrong and we should throw out, throw it out. 
we just have to be clear which one we mean when we're asking the question. It's the kind of thing philosophers like to do is to distinguish <laughs> different meanings of words. But we also had a second reason for, for pluralizing the idea of integration, which is that either in its ideal or its descriptive forms, uh, uh, integration plays out very differently according to different demographics of the student population of a school. Integration in all three senses um, so far mentioned, but especially the DSEG sense, has tended to foreground blacks and whites for, for obvious historical reasons. But I will note that in Zoe's por historical portion of the book, she has a fascinating of, account of how Mexican Americans, Chinese Americans, and indigenous Americans were affected by and responded as communities to the integration policies of the 50s and 60s, even though these were crafted for whites and blacks, but then they had to figure out, well, what, what do we do with these other racialized groups? But, and of course, now those, those other groups are core parts of the American student population. The character challenges and values exemplified in an in integrated school is affected by these de demographics very strongly. Beyond the greater racial diversity just mentioned, there are at least three other demographic characteristics that internally differentiate racial groups and also affect the character and challenges of ideal integration inside a school. These are ethnicity, immigration status, and socioeconomic class, which I will call just class um, going forward. All of these further pluralize the idea of integration. So on the class issue, imagine a school A, which is composed of half upper income whites and half lower income Latinxes. School B with half upper income Latinxes and half upper income whites and school C with half lower income whites and lower income Latinxes. These are three different, even, even though the racial character of those three is all the same, the, the class differentiation is gonna mean that the way you deal with integration inside that school and the issues raised by it are gonna be different. If you then fold in ethnic differentiations within racialized groups, mm. say Haitian Americans, a very important group in the Boston area, African Americans and Nigerian Americans are all blacks, they're all racially black but they have different histories and experiences that affect what integration is gonna look like when these groups are present in a school. And the same is true of Mexicans, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans uh, among Latinxes. Immigration status is yet a further modifier and important variable that affects uh, the way you know, integration plays out. And of course, there's another important variable that is the numbers and percentages of different groups. So for example, uh, a school that has 90% whites and 10% students of color of different groups is gonna have a very, very different character than a school that's 90% students of color of different groups and 10% whites. So the, you, you, the pluralizing of integrations is partly meant to capture the, the fact that you know, the older model was basically black students moving into predominantly white schools. But now it's just a whole different dimension. And, there, and it, there, there's so many more things going on under the label of, of uh, integration. Yeah, I mean, Larry, you know, I, I very much like uh, the way that you've described this for a number of reasons. Uh, and I won't be able to list all of the reasons why I like how you've described things here. But a few of the reasons why I've liked uh, a few of reasons why um, I, I'm, I'm excited by that description is that, you know, there. So you mentioned, of course, that the book is this kind of um, uh, it's a synthesis of, in many ways of uh, work by a philosopher and a historian. And what I really liked in the first part of your uh, response regarding the plurality here of integrations is that, you know, uh, um, uh, unpacking the conceptual, uh, the definitional, right, making these fine distinctions, as you mentioned, is, of course, the work that philosophers uh, 
often enjoy doing, uh, but placing that in the historical context seems so important for these conversations. As you describe things, um, you know, integration uh, may have meant uh, one thing in one moment when it was uh, the case that, uh, you know, sort of desegregation was the, uh, 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 the force of, 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 the, um, of the question before us, uh, and then sort of the move towards uh, integration, uh, then meaning something uh, about uh, kind of that sort of uh, just descriptive uh, uh, integration, right? Bodies in the space. Uh, and then the sort of normative ideal that you're suggesting of ideal integration uh, being about something more than uh, mere physical contact. I mean, uh, this feels to me like the sort of um, uh, uh, framework or uh, analysis uh, that draws heavily from the historical context and uh, the uh, sort of insights of the philosopher uh, attending to the concepts. Uh, another concept that you mentioned in this, um, in this discussion, alongside the uh, good comments that you had there about uh, the various forms of integration as we move away from uh, thinking only of kind of the black white uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of framing of things towards thinking about uh, immigration status, ethnicities, uh, and uh, uh, social class or class as you describe it, um, is that you, you mentioned uh, uh, inequality, right? Uh, uh, the ways in which oftentimes, um, despite these many different sort of uh, um, uh, understandings of integration, um, it might be assumed that integration, work towards integration in schools is about uh, at its sort of core is about um, uh, inequality. Um, you know, many people might think that segregation, right, uh, 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 is the thing that causes inequality in education. And what I'm hearing from your view and uh, the view that I know you develop uh, here in the book, it really seems that you kind of disagree with the idea that segregation itself is the cause of inequality in education. I mean, you seem to suggest and you say, and you mentioned previously white supremacy, but you seem to suggest that it's white supremacy uh, that's the cause of educational inequality. So I'd like to invite you now here to sort of say a little bit more about what you mean by that term, white supremacy, and to also describe how white supremacy manifests in these conversations about integration, segregation, and inequality in public schooling. Uh, great. So, yeah. again, you know, as you mentioned, some distinctions have to be made and they are historically grounded. Uh, uh, so starting with white supremacy, I think that in our moment, white supremacy refers to three different things. The first one is just mentioned that it refers to the social system of Jim Crow segregation. Yeah. That is a white supremacist system, you know, acknowledged to be so. And of course, in, in that system, you, you could say that segregation um, did cause inequality because segregation was an, an unequal system. So both white supremacy and segregation caused educational inequality, but they, too, they meant the same thing. So it was only sure. one thing doing, doing the work. Um, but a second, uh, a second meaning of white supremacy in the current moment is what we saw in the Charlottesville demonstration and the January 6th uh, insurrection at the, at the Capitol, and namely a movement promoting white supremacy. That movement's been around for a long, long time, but it got a real shot in the arm during the Trump period. Um, and the, this movement is promoting a society in which whites are and are regarded as deserving to be the dominant group. This white supremacist movement um, can be seen as seeking a social structure that's something like the segregationist social structure in, in the South, but it, it need not take that very particular form. And many people in that movement, even though they seek a white supremacist society don't really have a clear picture of what exactly that is going to look like. But that is a second uh, sort of reference of, of white supremacy in our, in our moment, that particular movement. But there's a third meaning of white supremacy, which has been particularly well articulated by the philosopher Charles Mills. And this refers to a social arrangement in which whites are unjustly advantaged over non-whites across many societal domains, income and wealth, health, 
occupation, residence, neighborhoods, uh, and education, and so on. This white dominance and white advantage does not need to be propped up by a uh, ideology of white supremacy, such as was involved in the historical. Um, uh -oh. Sorry, go away. No, no trouble, Larry. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, it, so, so uh, white supremacy in this Charles Mills sense is, is a structure of unjust white advantage, but it needn't be underpinned by an ideology that says that that's right. right. That's right that white people dominate. And, you know, many people in our society just kind of carry on and reproduce this white supremacy without necessarily uh, being invested in the idea that there's some good reason for having it. Right. Um, and this is the sense of white supremacy that I'm primarily uh, concerned with. Um, but it's, it's important to understand that, uh, that it's one among others, because if you don't differentiate that and you, and you sort of conflate these three different kinds of white supremacy, it's, you know, it, makes, it makes for a lot of confusion. For example, it makes people think that if you talk about white supremacy, you're saying that every white person is a you know died in died in the wool racist who hates you know hates black people or hates other other people of color, but it it doesn't it doesn't this form the third form doesn't uh, require that. Um, in fact, many many white people might think that it's an unjust system and recognize that it's an unjust system, but. But, but not necessarily take on the responsibility for trying to do anything about it other than like voting for a candidate who's more likely to, to uh, try to cut into it than some other, than some, some other candidate. Um, one way of thinking about the relationship between white supremacy in this third Mills sense and in the Jim Crow sense is that eventually the Jim Crow form of, of uh, white supremacy was dismantled, the legal structure was eventually undermined, but that didn't bring down white supremacy in the mill sense. White supremacy in the mill sense survived the end of white supremacy in the Jim Crow, in the Jim Crow sense. Whites remained the dominant, powerful, and advantaged groups, uh, you know, in the southern United States, but in the United States more generally, without the legal structure propping them up. Now, of course, I'm giving this giving this talk in uh, May, 2021. And as we speak, some Republican legislature is actually trying to institute laws that are actually Jim Crow-like. And that's extremely disturbing. And it blurs the point that I was just saying about, you know, it's not the case that we have actually left Jim Crow fully behind. We might've thought we did, but horrible as it is, we, we haven't. Um, so anyway, the main point, this is very schematic, but the main point for explaining how, uh, to, to explain how white supremacy in the mill sense is a source of educational inequality is that the society outside the school mm -hmm. divides the population along a, a spectrum of extreme advantage and disadvantage, which we've seen even more prominent in the COVID period. period. And it's, I mean, it's increased in the COVID period, but it's also sort of been exposed in the COVID period. And this extreme advantage dis disadvantage tends to overlap with racially defined groups, though not, not totally, not solely. Students at the bottom end of this disadvantage hierarchy, no matter what their potential for intellectual growth as individual students, they bring these comparative disadvantages to their schools. They're less healthy. They bring stresses from inadequate parental income. They often have housing instability. They move around so that, that interferes with their, their schooling. There are often tensions within the, high, within the household because of not having enough money. All of these things hamper the learning of, of kids in school. Schools can do their best to rectify or buffer these disadvantages and many wonderful schools have done absolutely the best they could 
with students with these disadvantages. But if you think about the ideal of equality, students with these disadvantages as a group cannot attain a robust level of equal education with students who don't have those disadvantages. But disadvantage is only half the story of how white supremacy brings about educational inequality. The other half looks at the advantaged families at the top. Advantaged families tend to engage in what is called opportunity hoarding. The parents can buy educational enrichment, private tutors, college counselors for their offspring as a group, and those advantaged students will then be better positioned to do well in school. Now, these processes that I've just described, poverty disadvantaging some students and opportunity hoarding advantage advantaging others are not purely racial in character. And in the book, Zoe and I emphasize that white supremacy is partly and essentially propped up by class-based processes that are embedded in the particular form of neoliberal financialized and predatory capitalism that we live in in the United States and in many countries in the West. In fact, it's not, it's not possible to gain a full comprehension of white supremacy as a structure without recognizing the deep intertwining of race and class processes that go into that and that have sometimes been called, especially recently, racial capitalism. So back to your question, if segregation means simply the separation of racially distinct populations into different schools, this separation is not the cause of educational inequality, but at most one mechanism by which white supremacy operates to cause that inequality. If someone replies, but aren't integrated schools generally better resourced than one race dominant schools, where the racial group in question is Black, Latinx, or Indigenous? Yes, they are. But this does not show that the schools are better because they are integrated. Mm. It's that they are better schools because they're better resourced than poorly resourced schools. The fact that the better resourced schools tend to have more white students is itself just a manifestation of white supremacy. So it's white supremacy, not the separation of students into racially distinct schools that causes the inequality. Yeah, so that's 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 really helpful. I'm just I'm reminded in this moment of a, 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 a experience that I had once uh, giving a talk. Uh, as you know, I used to uh, work in New Hampshire, and I was giving I was up in New Hampshire giving a talk to an auditorium full of, uh, to my mind, well-intentioned uh, folks uh, trying to understand some issues about schools and schooling uh, policies. Uh, and we, we began talking about um, uh, Brown v. Board and sort of separate, um, uh, whether, whether separate was inherently unequal. And I had the view that uh, separate isn't inherently unequal, but tends to be uh, uh, unequal because of some of the background conditions. And that's really what I hear you to be describing here in that if I can connect your answer here to your previous uh, um, observations regarding the plurality of integrations, you know, if it's the case that in this country we've thought about integration as being, uh, in some of its early moments, school integration as being sort of an antidote uh, for inequality, and then we continued that thinking uh, uh, throughout, it seems that there is a way in which uh, uh, integration seems to kind of paper over a lot of the subtlety and, uh, uh, and nuance uh, that I hear you to be describing here uh, in ways that uh, uh, can be resisted um, uh, if we sort of uh, prioritize or place within uh, uh, the, the core of our aims uh, equality uh, as the thing that we're after, right? And so recognizing that if we're after equality, then perhaps, right, integration is going to be helpful in some moments or less helpful in some other moments or particular types of integration are going to be more appealing, more attractive uh, uh, than others. But what I'm hearing you describe here, Larry, is um, in some ways um, a context for greater nuance in our discussions of what integration in public schools uh, uh, is and perhaps can be towards this greater goal of equality. Is that, is that relatively accurate? Yes, I mean, I guess I would just add that yeah. I think in a way, from the point of view of equality, integration is a kind of smokescreen. It's yeah. kept people from recognizing the importance of white supremacy essentially and, and class domination. And it's sort of fascinating that in many discussions of 
of integration, there was a, a long piece by, I uh, can't think of his name, he's a Boston Globe writer mm. um, a couple months ago. He just like assumed that inequality brings about I'm sorry, the it's, integration uh, bridge about yeah. inequality. It's, it's just an assumption that many people make. They don't even clearly distinguish the two things as two different ideas sure. sometimes. Sure. And so, yes, we, yeah. you know, we care a lot about uh, integration, but its relationship to equality is really very weak. Mm. And unless the society outside the school is changed, there's no way that you can have equality inside the school. So, you know, to take an example of, uh, you know, Biden's, Biden's kind of anti, the anti-poverty dimension of, of Biden's, uh, the, the bill that was passed. Sure. Yep. Some people have said anti-poverty measures are the best school reform or, or kind of the most effective school reform uh, you know, kind of initiative that you can do. And, you know, presumably we will actually see those students who benefit from his program doing better in school without anything necessarily different happening within the school. It's just that sure. those students will be able to avail themselves of the learning potentialities there. So, so I, I do think, I, I, we do want a more nuanced understanding of of integration in all these different ways, but we don't see integration as closely connected to equality. Yeah. And as I mean, even diversionary. So, 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 uh, and I'm, I'm just sort of glancing at the clock and recognizing that uh, we're gonna, we're running short on time. Uh, and so I wanna remind those in attendance that uh, they can uh, submit questions in the Q and A uh, box that they've got there. Um, but I, I wanna ask you one additional question, uh, Larry, before we uh, segue into uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience. I mean, so based on what you've, what you've just said uh, regarding sort of the nuance uh, here, um, uh, um, uh, uh, on the concept of, of integration and the ways in which uh, integration might serve as something of a smokescreen for, um, uh, you know, um, aims of, of, of reduction, reducing uh, inequality, as you mentioned. I mean, I think a reader could take a, could, could, could spend some time with your book uh, and perhaps think that you've got, you know, kind of two different views on integration, right? I mean, so, you've got a complex take here. It's, 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 it's nuanced and it's specific. And I want to invite you to say more about it. Um, you know, in, in chapter four of the book, it seems um, that, you know, you're what, what, what you what you say about descriptive integration, which you mentioned previously. Um, in chapter four of the book, it seems like you're a bit critical of descriptive integration. But then in chapter five of the book, it seems as though you're a bit more favorable uh, towards descriptive integration. And you've said a little bit already about sort of, you know, how descriptive integration is, you know, um, uh, useful, but perhaps uh, insufficient for some of these aims. But I'd just like you to clarify your position here um, so that folks who might have kind of this traditional view of integration, um, uh, uh, this descriptive uh, uh, inter integration view, that they might understand sort of how you're thinking about things uh, such that you might be inclined to say, uh, to be critical, but also to be favorable in certain instances. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do a, sh a sort of a shorter version <laughs> of this, but in, sure. in chapter four, it, basically we think that there is a common argument in favor of uh, integration, which we think is completely misguided. And we call this the capital argument. And it's basically the argument that disadvantaged students benefit by sitting in a classroom and being in a school with advantaged students because the advantaged students' families have all of this financial capital, social capital, cultural capital, and it rubs off on the, uh, on the disadvantaged students. And that's like really great. So we, uh, we just trash that that argument, that that argument, uh, I'll just mention two two of the arguments that we counter arguments that we give. One is that the argument fails to recognize that the disadvantaged students bring something vital to the educational encounter with the advantaged students that the advantaged students benefit from. They learn, uh, they get a much greater sense of the 
a range of different kinds of groups in the society than they would in their single race um, schools. They get they're better positioned to sort of understand and learn about the structures of injustice, partly from hearing the experience of uh, experiences of their classmates, but also it's just a, 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 a better kind of opportunity for them to, if the teacher is teaching this, the teacher has to teach it in order for this to happen. But um, to sort of teach about this, the structures of injustice that they will become, they're already part of as students, but they will be, become part of um, as, as adults. And uh, so, so that, that's, I'll, I'll just stop there. We, we have like 10 different arguments as to why the capital argument is a terrible argument. But in the following chapter, we, we praise integration and we praise integration on basically moral and civic grounds that mm -hmm. we say that um, it's, it's only in these really mixed settings that it's fully possible to really get people to sort of learn how to get past their stereotypes of different groups, how to learn to respect people who are different but also how to appreciate the difference itself, how to appreciate racial others that have different heritages, different experiences. It's only in mixed classrooms that those can really happen. And that seems to us a very solid basis for an integration program. And it, it completely leaves aside this whole capital argument, which we think um, you know, schools that are, are kind of like bringing in integration under a capital framework are actually damaging their, their school communities and damaging the education of all of the different groups, the advantage and the disadvantaged students. But that on, on civic and moral grounds, that, that's a really good reason for integrating those, for, in, you know, having integrated schools and, and classrooms. Yeah, so I mean, I think what's what's great about that um, uh, that approach that you've got there is that um, you're really able again to sort of uh, speak to the um, uh, to the nuance, the complexity of this topic. And I know that you mentioned that there are you know a number of arguments that you and Zoe develop here uh, uh, to kind of press against some of the um, uh, the traditional. Um, uh, the uh, sort of uh, traditional view of, of, of um, uh, what happens in these interactions. And so perhaps, uh, you know, uh, having given some of those arguments now, uh, our uh, audience is uh, further enticed uh, to pick up the book themselves and uh, 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 enjoy the other arguments. Uh, but let me, let me transition us now um, uh, to the uh, Q to, to uh, the queue of questions that we've got from the audience. Um, it's the case that we've got a number of questions here and I'm gonna just sort of um, uh, uh, try to jump right in. One of the first questions that we have is a question about um, uh, integrations and uh, plurality in the context of intersectionality. Uh, so this person here is um, uh, invoking some of Kimberly Crenshaw's work. Um, the, the question is, does integration also begin with our understanding of identity as an overlapping of experience or experiences? Um, you know, is there uh, intersectionality in the Black community or in other communities um, that might uh, have some significance for the project that you have described? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, we, we didn't sort of think about it as such, but I do feel that the, the insights of the intersectionality framework fit in with the idea that you have to think of integrations in a plural way because you need to think of the student population as having a lot of differences. So, you know, yeah. one way of looking at it, at what I've said is that say, a student has a racial identity and an ethnic identity, and that those two identities uh, sort of interact in ways that intersectionality theory is 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 speaking to. We we don't uh, you know take on the whole intersectionality framework and all of the different like kind of sexuality differences, gender differences, uh, gender expression differences, but but I think the spirit of it is um, you know that 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 we 
are within the within the spirit of that intersectionality because of emphasizing that it's not just you know black white asian but that there are very important division you know differentiations within those groups that affect and and create complex identities that need to also be taken account of in an integration program kind of based on the right foundation yeah i mean so 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 if i'm hearing you correctly then um it sounds as though there are um uh, some really uh, useful um, uh, sort of insights from uh, intersectional theory that uh, sort of align with some of what you're, uh, you and, and, and Zoe Burkholder are doing in the book. Uh, another question that's emerged uh, here uh, is a question about the idea of opportunity hoarding, which you mentioned briefly before. Uh, and so this uh, question asker um, uh, says uh, that they're very interested in the idea of opportunity hoarding and how uh, many white people do it with or without the awareness of how it plays out to amplify both advantage or disadvantage uh, and ultimately perpetuates uh, these systems of inequality. Uh, the question uh, with uh, a, a lot of punctuation behind it is, how do we stop this, right? I mean, uh, what's the response then to these patterns of opportunity hoarding? You know, it's very, I mean, research has shown that opportunity hoarding has increased among people, um, you know, at a given upper level. Sure. And, you know, as the questioner um, points out, opportunity hoarding is not necessarily an intentional group project to keep your group. It might just be you're trying to get your help your own kid. It's just sure. that all the other people who have the same resources that you do that a lot of other people don't have by, you know, the aggregate of all that becomes a group opportunity hoarding. But it's also true that that uh, I mean, uh, Sean Reardon is a sociologist at Stanford who who's, who has studied the ways that um, that people that people of a certain income level or sort of place in the income hierarchy have gotten more focused mm. on helping their kids get ahead than say when I was a kid. Mm. You know. Um, opportunity hoarding has always been there, but it is really greatly intensified. I think it's partly intensified because of the neoliberalist philosophy that, that sort of promotes a much more individualistic way of thinking about your child. You know, so like an alternative way, which we talk about this in the book a little bit, um, an alternative way of thinking about how you do something good for your kid so one way, the opportunity hoarding way is I get my kid into the top track classes and I get them to have the best college counselor or blah, blah, blah. But another way of thinking about what's good for your kid is to think that it's good for your kid to become a moral person and yeah. to become a person who is civically engaged in trying to make their, their society a better society. And um, schools, can contribute to that through embracing a kind of social justice mission. And many schools have done this by you know, nothing like a majority, but many oh. schools and districts have whole, whole districts have said essentially, we are um, part of what education means to us in this school is that we're creating a, a community of people who are both concerned about each other, but they're also concerned about the society outside the school, which impacts on the school and which we're trying to get our students to understand is uh, something they should engage with. So if, you know, if parents could sort of shift, shift their way of thinking, that would, and with the help of the schools and districts and the teachers, you know, maybe something could happen. Obviously, with the extreme inequality we have in our society, you're not going to be able to get too far without, without uh, taking that on. And, you know, to the credit of the Biden administration, they are trying to take it on. Mm -hmm. So there's even some little rays of hope out there. But, you know, it's, it's a great question. And I don't, have much more than that as an answer to it. 
Well, I think it's a fantastic <laughs> answer. I mean, you, you've, you've, Larry, you've described the ways in which, you know, the systems in which we operate uh, uh, sort of incentivize uh, certain types of behavior and, um, you know, suggesting that perhaps then the solution uh, is in part Yes, to change the uh, um, the attitudes and the desires of the persons within the system, but also perhaps suggesting that we would need some uh, larger scale systemic change. Um, in in many ways, that kind of ties into another question that we have here in the in the queue. Uh, someone has written in to say that efforts to desegregate and decolonize are often taken up by teachers themselves, as seen in master's programs where students are asked to interrogate their role in upholding white supremacy before they enter the classroom, right? So these sort of pre-service uh, uh, um, experiences uh, that teachers have. Um, and the question to you is, do you think that addressing integrations on the teacher to student level has any effect if the system itself is so fundamentally segregated, right? So again, a question about uh, the uh, interactions that occur within a larger structure, a larger system. Uh, to your mind, is it the case that um, uh, uh, paying attention to these sort of interactions, teacher to student and so forth, um, are these interactions likely to sort of uh, arrive at the, the ends that you've been describing or uh, uh, do we need to really take on uh, the fundamentally segregated uh, nature of uh, the broader society? Well, you know, I don't see the fundamentally segregated aspect of the society as being as important as the fundamentally unequal dimensions right. of society. So you could have like an integrated school that was still very, very stratified. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, ha having said that, I just think you need both the macro and the micro. I think that teachers can, uh, you know, teachers who, who especially who've gone through some of those kinds of programs where they've come to sort of recognize their own role in, in the, the legacies of, of colonialism and settler colonialism and slavery and segregation and so on, and have, have kind of done some work on themselves. I think that the teachers can, can be very, uh, you know, powerful forces in, in uh, cl cl the life of the students in those classrooms. At the same time, you know, and this is totally central to the argument of the book, without the larger changes, you can't make that much progress. It's, you, you have to, you, another way to put this is to say that, think about it in a kind of social movement point of view, way, point of view. Um, if, if, there, if we're thinking of kind of movements within education, you know, and the decolonizing movement is like a movement, not only in education, but partly in education, those movements have to be allied with larger movements for social justice that deal with health, they deal with wealth, they deal with income. They've all, all these groups have to be working together. And you saw this a little bit in the teacher mm. rebellions of 2018 and 2019, sure. not, not as much as you would like, but some of those teacher groups recognized the larger links and made those to be demands that were sometimes part of their, it's usually union groups that were behind these particular ones. Um, and social justice unionism is actually an example of, of a way that teachers are sort of linking to these larger goals. So I, I hope that addresses the question. The it, defi it definitely does. I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, we're, we're short on time and, and we've got a number of great questions here. So I'm, I'm going to just make a, a, a decision. Apologies to those who have questions that we might not get to answer, but uh, I think this is a question uh, uh, that might be particularly helpful for us as we move forward. Uh, but the question asker says, given today's political polarity, do you believe that there is some language that might make sense to both the left and the right, and perhaps those in between, when explaining these concepts that you're advancing? Or do we essentially need to have multiple conversations? And if so, how does that lead to moving forward as a society? So, so, so you know, can we come together on these, uh, 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 at least to have the conversation here? Or are there really sort of different conversations that need to be taking place in order to realize some of the aims of equality uh, that you and your co-author are suggesting? Um. Well, you know, for that to be the last question, I mean, that is a huge, that is a really huge, yeah. huge question. 
I'll try to boil it down. I don't think at this point that just having conversations across the partisan divide is going to take us very far. What mm. I'm hoping is that policies of the Biden administration will be experienced by the Republican, the kind of less educated Republicans as mm. something that actually helps them. And it might have the effect of making them less invested in their Republican identity. After all, that particular group, less educated, uh, you know, pe people with high school uh, degrees who, who have shifted to the Republicans, they didn't used to be Republicans. Mm. I mean, that group, you know, its predecessor group didn't used to be Republicans and it doesn't have to be. And I, I do think that you need some sense of respect across divides to have that conversation and you're not getting it. I mean, I watch Fox News, so I sort of know why, how they're, the other side is looking at things. They live in a different universe than I live in. Mm. And it's just very hard to have those conversations. You know, I'm not in the classroom anymore. I'm a retired professor. And I don't know how that's playing out in like the elementary school classroom, maybe elementary school students from <laughs> who have different parents or in different parties, maybe they're able to have conversations and maybe you can carry them forward. I just don't know. I'm not, I'm not close enough to that. I am, you know, I'm very pessimistic about the incredible divide in this country. It's like freaks me out every single day. Um, but I do, I'm, I'm, I'm mildly hopeful that some of the policies will cut into that Republican support and sort of maybe shake things up a little bit and, and, and make it easier to then have the conversations. Yeah, I mean, you know, given what you've said earlier on about the uh, plurality of these integrations, I'm, um, I'm, I'm wondering if it's even possible to sort of imagine that there are some forms of integration that might be attractive to some uh, segments of the population, uh, and, uh, you know, with some buy in on those forms of integration, then perhaps, uh, you know, that's sort of to say it in a crude way, the thin end of the wedge uh, for making uh, uh, some inroads to other uh, conversations about the broader aim of equality across various uh, forms of uh, advantage and disadvantage. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So we're, 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 we've got a minute left. And so I'd like to uh, first thank you, Larry, for all that you've given us. Um, you know, uh, you, you've, you've uh, really sort of um, extended such generosity in um, uh, uh, talking us through some aspects of the book. Um, I know that uh, there are many in the audience who are uh, definitely uh, even more excited than they were previously to pick up the book to uh, really dig into some of these arguments here. Um, and so I know that uh, Benjamin has some final uh, and concluding comments, uh, but I just want to thank you once again, Larry, uh, for all that you've given us here. There's a lot to, uh, to chew on and, and sort of tease out uh, as we think about uh, integrations uh, and your contribution to our thinking on this subject. It's thanks. A, and thanks to you as well, Winston, for kind of amplifying, clarifying, and moving things forward. It was really of course. Good. It was a real, a real, real delight, as always. Yeah. Yes. As always. Yes, truly, thank you both for such a fantastic conversation. This was such an amazing way to spend part of an afternoon. Thanks to everyone out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. As I said, please learn more about this incredible book and purchase integrations at harvard.com. I've put the link in the chat a couple times. On behalf of the Safra Center and Harvard Bookstore, both here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy your weekend, keep reading, and stay safe, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Bye-bye.